In this video, we're gonna look at what I call a basic flight plan. So basic flight plan is one that we don't have to refer to the map for. We don't have root sector wind and temp for. So I'll actually give you the wind components and the ISO deviations, as well as distances and tracks if we need them. If you wanna follow along with this flight plan, it's gonna be the first worked example in the flight planning basic section of the textbook. It's also worth grabbing out a blank flight plan form as we'll be filling in that as we go. Now when we do this flight plan, we're gonna start by asking yourself a couple of questions. We'll then look at putting data onto the flight plan and then going through our climb, descent and cruise information. We'll start with the two questions I just mentioned. So before I start any flight plan or any question in this exam, I always ask myself two questions. One, what flight level am I going to fly at? And two, how am I gonna break up the flight plan? So I encourage you, every flight plan you do, just ask yourself those two questions and they'll get you thinking down the right path. So the first question being, what flight level am I gonna fly at or what altitude am I gonna fly at? It's kind of a generic question, just purely for the purposes of getting you thinking about how you're gonna tackle the altitude side. So it's not necessarily asking you what specific flight level you're gonna fly at, but it's more talking about is it a maximum question? Is it an optimum question? Have they given you the flight level in the question maybe? Or do we have to put any abnormal penalties onto it? Kind of just gets you thinking about how am I gonna tackle that aspect of it? Because that's one of the more difficult parts of flight planning. The other question is how do I wanna break up the flight plan? So there's a few reasons why you would break up a flight plan rather than just go from departure straight to destination. Uh, the obvious one is climbs and descents. So we plan, uh, given we plan climb and descent data, the more or less basic flight plan, the minimum you can do on a flight plan from departure to destination would be going from departure to a top of climb position, flying to top of descent, and then descending into the destination and doing an approach at the end. Now, when I say approach at the end, we're actually just adding a little bit of fuel for that approach. We're not actually planning any approach. Don't worry about that too much. You can see the information in the question. We have, we have a thousand mile leg. We're gonna be cruising at flight level 310, flying a Mark 0.8, and we have a brakes release weight of 79.3 ton. We're gonna assume icing conditions and nil wind at all levels. Both the departure and destination aerodromes are suitable during the times of intended use, so no weather holding required there. So the first thing I'm gonna do is ask myself the two questions. One being what level we're gonna fly up. So in this one, it's pretty easy. The flight level has been given in the question. I'm gonna be flying off level 310. Second question is how do I wanna break up the flight plan? Now, I'd wanna break up the flight plan for obviously climbs and descents like we talked about, but as well as any major track changes, like 30 degrees or more, uh, or if there's any what I call a vent happening, so that's engines failing, depressurizations, your damps is failing, um, changing altitudes, any reason why we'd have to break up the fly plan would be something like that. Now for this one, because there's no abnormal situation arising, because we're not changing levels, we can just keep a fairly basic fly plan by going departure, top of climb, top of descent, destination, and then approach. And it's written up like this. Go from departure to top of climb, top of descent into our destination and I like to write approach at the end there. Now the way these tables work is whatever line we're currently working on, that's where we're going to. So this line here, we're going to top of climb. If we're working on this line, for example, we're going to top of descent, so we'll be in the cruise at that point. As well as this destination line, we're flying to the destination, so that's gonna be the descent line, and I'll draw that in a second. Once we've got a flight plan drawn up and we've had to think about how we're gonna get the altitude, this one being pretty easy, flow 310, we can start filling in the information. So I like to fill in all the information in this section here, and then we move on to the next step. So I call this step one, and it's more or less data extraction, taking information from the question, potentially from the map, from the root sector was in temp, from the calculator, from the whiz wheel, and just put it in this section here. And that's a really good foundation for the rest of the flight plan. Now when filling out this section, I recommend we go column by column, top to bottom. 
filling in all the information we can, all the information that's relevant for the given question. So we'll start with the flight level column. I know I'm going to be climbing to top of climb, cruising to top of descent, and descending into my destination. The temperature will be ISO for the climb and the cruise. I'm not going to write in for the descent because ISO deviation doesn't make any difference for descent. And I'll also point out that the temperature we write in here is the ISO deviation. It's not a specific temperature, it's just the deviation because that's what all the charts are wanting to know pretty much. Mark number, we're going to be cruising at 0.8. We'll go ahead and calculate the TAS using the calculator like we have in the past. That gives me 470 knots. Don't have any track or wind information in this question. And they've told us the wind component is nil. Ground speed, because there's no wind, would be the same as the TAS, 470 knots. So that's what I consider step one done, is data extraction. Drawing up a little diagram here of what the flight plan kind of looks like. Going from departure, top of climb, top of descent, into our destination with an approach. It's kind of a graphical representation of what we're drawing up here. So first thing we're going to do is calculate our climb information. We'll do that from the climb table. We'll be using uh, the ISA table, going to flow 310, and the brakes release weight being 79,300 kilos, we'll be using the 80 ton column. The information from the climb table tells us we'll be climbing for 21 minutes. We're using 2,850 kilos of fuel, and we're covering a distance of 126 miles through the air. Now, given that there's no wind, the distance, the ground distance is going to be the same as the air distance. So the distance column there is your ground distance. And the column over here is obviously your air distance as the name suggests. Because we have a brakes release weight and we have a climb fuel figure, it means we know our top of climb weight. So I'll fill that in here. Now notice I'm only filling out the end zone column. The reason for that is I want to keep this start zone column blank or keep that empty. That way it just keeps the flight plan nice and neat. The other thing is the start zones here is the same number as the end zone on the previous line. So this start zone here would be that end zone. This start zone here would be that end zone. So if I need the information, it's right there on the flight plan in front of me and it just keeps a little bit more neat rather than writing it twice. Now we've finished getting the climb data. Next thing we're going to do is actually get the descent data. The reason for that is we don't know how much the flight is going to be cruise until we know how much is climb and how much is descent. The reason for that is we know the total distance of the flight is 1,000 miles. We know 126 of that is climb. So what we're going to do is work out how much of that is descent and then that will tell us how much of that is cruise and then we can go through and do our estimated mid zone and get our fuel figures. So the next thing we're gonna do is estimate our landing weight. And once we've estimated the landing weight, it means we can get some descent data. Now estimating the landing weight you've done before, we have a thousand mile leg burning roughly 10 kilos per mile and we'll add on a climb allowance of 1600 kilos. So that's flight fuel of 11,600 kilos. And we'll take that off our brakes release weight of 79,300 kilos. That gives us a estimated landing weight of 67,700 kilos. So we'll be using the 70 ton column for our descent information. Now later on, we're going to be looking at estimating landing weights from different positions. For example, the top of climb position, and it will mean the landing weight is a little bit more accurate. We're going to look at that in the next flight plan. For this one, it's going to get the total 1,000 miles times by 10 plus 1,600, and we'll take that off our brakes release weight like we just did. But expect in the next lesson, we'll be looking at estimating that landing weight just a little bit more accurately. So for now, we're using 70 ton data and descending from flight level 310. We'll fill out the information on the destination line. So I can see from the descent tables, we'll be 
to setting for 21 minutes using 660 kilos of fuel covering 107 air nautical miles which will be the same as ground nautical miles because there's no wind so the information we have we have a thousand mile leg of which 126 is climb 107 is descent that means the remaining distance in the cruise is 767 miles. So this will be our cruise distance, which we'll write in up here. Now that we have a cruise distance, we've also got a mark number, which means we've got everything we need to calculate an estimated mid zone weight. So to calculate estimated mid zone weight, we'd usually be taking into account the wing component. Now we don't have any wing component here, so it makes it a little bit easier. We have a distance of 767. We'll multiply that by the SAR. For mark 0.8, it's 9.5. Get this number divided by 2, and we'll take that off our start zone weight, which is our top of climb weight of 76,450 kilos. That gives us an estimated mid zone weight of, of 72,806. We call that 73 tonne. Estimated mid zone weight gives us to the nearest one ton. Now that we have an estimated mid zone weight, we'll go to the Boeing 727 manual, find flow level 310, 73 tons, find the fuel flow for that. So the fuel flow I've got from the book is 4,354.5. Next thing we're going to do is work out our estimated time interval. The reason for that is we've currently got fuel flow, and if we work at ETI next, that's going to give us our zone fuel, or the fuel burnt. So we'll try to do it in this order, just to keep us as efficient as possible. We're going into a little bit more detail in the next video about the order we're going to follow. So the ETI, we'll calculate by getting the distance, 767, and divide that by ground speed, 470. This gives us 1.63 hours, which is 97.9 minutes. So we'll call that 98 minutes. To get the zone fuel, we want to multiply the time by the fuel flow, or the fuel flow by the time. It gives us a zone fuel of 7,097.8 kilos. Write that in the zone fuel section. As we looked at in the cruise section, we've got to check the estimated mid zone was correct. So we'll start by adding the uh, end zone for top of climb, so that's the top of climb weight, to the end zone for the cruise leg. So to calculate the end zone for the cruise leg, we're going to get the start zone, subtract the zone fuel. That gives us 69,352 kilos. And to check the estimated mid zone, we'll just add the two numbers together, then divide by two and make sure it's within a ton of our estimated mid zone, which it is. So it comes out to 72,901. That would be 73 ton, which means our estimated mid zone weight checks out. So the weight we have now, 69,352, that's our top of descent weight, or the weight before we begin the descent. So now what we can do is take off the descent weight, and that's going to give us the weight that we arrive at the airport. So 69,352, take the descent fuel of 660. That gives us 68,692. 68,692. We also have 400 kilos for approach, so we'll take that 400 kilos off. 68,292. This number here we've got, that's our landing weight, 68,292 kilos. That's our landing weight. So what we'll do, we'll work out what the total flight fuel was. And then we'll add some reserves 
and we'll work out what the minimum fuel on board at brakes release weight will be because quite often that's what the question is asking for. Now to get the flight fuel, we can do a couple of different things. We can add all these numbers up, but you run the risk of clicking the wrong number, especially when you're doing five or six different cruise segments. So what I prefer to do is just get the landing weight and subtract that away from my brakes release weight, and that's going to give me the same same number. So 79,300 take 68,292 gives me a flight fuel. Gives me a flight fuel of 11,008 kilos. Now to add reserves, we're going to need to add a variable reserve, which is 10%. So we'll call that 1,100.8. Add a fixed reserve, 3,300 kilos. And we'll add taxi in 100 kilos. Given this is a brakes release weight, we don't need to worry about the startup and taxi fuel out to the runway. So the total fuel we need for this flight is 15,508.8 kilos to make it legal. And this is the first flight plan done. So the next one, we're going to do the first question from the flight planning section, the flight planning basic section. Just spend a little bit more time talking about what specific steps to take, especially for the cruise leg, because there's a very, very efficient way to do it. Quite a lot of people don't do it. So we're just going to stress the real efficient way to do it and what numbers to click on the calculator. And we're going to have a chat about the memory function on the calculator as well. Hopefully this made sense. If not, feel free to watch it a couple of times. Also, don't forget to read the textbook uh, through this section because it explains it a lot as well. I'll see you in the next video.